how to master HTML? You might be thinking that this guy is crazy. Everyone knows HTML, right? But stick with me. And in this video, I want to share a few important grown up tips for HTML regards to that HTML and DOM area with you and tell you how much you're missing out in your HTML basic learning. If you're new here, make sure you leave a like, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon. This is free of cost and helps the channel grow. So you cannot be discussing about what all of this is in depth or how you can learn it. You can check out the code dams full stack learning path. It's basically in the front end section at the top. But most of these things over here are important. At some point, you would need to understand them to have a better understanding of the front end tooling. All right, the first thing I think a lot of you guys miss out is on semantic tags plus SEO focused tags, right? So let's start with semantic tags first. So if you are one of those developers who use divs all the way, probably not a good idea in today's time because we have so many tags like section, main, aside etc which provide a lot more semantic meaning to things like screen readers for example for accessibility so you should at least try to make use of the section or a side section for a section aside for a sidebar thing main for some main content and you know all the semantic tags which are there these all are block tags so you would have to like see which one is blocked which one is not um but yeah seo focus tags when i say seo focus tag what i mean is using the correct h1 h2 h3 headings and the meta tags for description and the title of the page making sure you have the open graph tags enabled so that your html page works great on social media websites so having all the seo plus social media understanding like what these websites or what these search engines expect you to write in your html code is also an html understanding right a lot of people don't know about open graph tags for example which is used by twitter facebook pretty much all social media websites when you share that link and that preview appears right this title this description and this image over here when you write something on social media so that's open graph tags when you are writing with h1 google considers that as your heading of the page one of the headings right their most important headings should be h1 and h2 then h3 and so on in that order so having this semantic understanding plus seo focus understanding of tags in html is an important concept the second focus should be on performance somehow so when i say performance what i mean is concepts like preloading and prefetching. So if you don't know about what preloading and prefetching are, these are some techniques to actually load some of the resources which you're sure that you would need eventually on the start of your web page when the web page just starts downloading, the HTML starts downloading. So these are like some performance hacks which a lot of frameworks use these days, Next.js, Remix, these frameworks like use it out of the box, right? So preloading the assets by default, prefetching them so that when you click on something, you don't have to wait for that page to be, you know, downloaded from the end server. You already have that in the browser cache. So preloading, prefetching are a couple of techniques for speeding up your things. And these are done through link tags. There is no JavaScript or anything involved, although you can do some preloading with JS as well. But link tags are used for preloading and prefetching. Similarly, placements of script tag, for example, is also important which one you want to choose async or defer and where you should put it below body that's like an important point so that you don't block the rendering of the main page and so on so having these performance things which you can do with the html page itself is also one thing which i think you should spend some time in look for how preloading prefetching works look for css content visibility it's also like a new attribute now we are getting a little bit into html and css so these are a few hacks and a few techniques which are very easy to learn and gives you massive performance boost benefits but a lot of people don't know about my third tip is around things like document object model and the shadow dom which is also becoming very popular especially with our number five thing which we will discuss so hold on to that. But DOM and Shadow DOM, these are like two, three concepts which are constructed out of your HTML document. So your HTML document is taken by the browser and it's constructed into a DOM, which is nothing more than an API, a, a kind of like there's an API surface over here, which is exposed to CSS and another API is exposed to JavaScript. And this DOM is the actual thing 
which the user sees on the page, not the original HTML, the DOM, which is constructed. And this is like a tree of all your nodes and tags and values and this and that. So know about how DOM works really with these JavaScript and CSS world. What are the APIs and JavaScript as document? In CSS, you have tag selectors and properties and keys and values. And know a little bit about what Shadow DOM is also. We're gonna discuss Shadow DOM in number five, like I said, but Shadow DOM is a part of DOM, which allows you to do some interesting things. So know a little bit more about DOM. It's not much about HTML, but compared to how HTML really works with JavaScript and CSS. My next thing for you is actually talking a bit about forms and data validation. You wouldn't know so many people don't really know about how to use data validation in HTML5 forms itself. You probably don't need that 20 kb jquery library or something to do validation with html forms because now this is like very very simple you have to learn about the required attribute you have to learn about how you can restrict the length of an input with max length min length attribute you can learn about how to restrict a particular format to a regular expression value, restrict the amount of the type of files which are being uploaded and all of this is just done in HTML. I'm not talking about JavaScript over here. This is done in HTML itself. You can, I mean, I don't know the number of people I have seen which write a JavaScript code to have an input field which when pressed on enter should do something, right? If you have written on key down and e dot key code or e dot something is enter, then do that. I mean, you just have to wrap this inside a form with on summit and you are done, right? Whenever somebody writes in this input field and hits enter, if there's a button or heck, if there is not a button as well, this on summit function would be called, right? And if you want to take it one more step further, just like Remix does, Remix and its framework, you can also work with form action and form method and stuff like this. But for the most part, I do believe like a lot of validation and a lot of processing the form information is not a lot more accessible to people, especially with the frameworks like React and Vue and this and that, giving you all sorts of JavaScript powers within your HTML view that is obscured away that this functionality and this stuff is already available in HTML. And the fifth and the final thing which I want to discuss, you should know as an HTML developer, is the concept of web components. Now, web components is not a relatively new technology. It's just that it hasn't taken off that much, but that doesn't mean that it's not relevant. It's very relevant and it allows you to write reusable components with the help of HTML, CSS and JavaScript itself. And these are just like components you would hear in React or Vue or anything, but these are like standardized components for the web. They are reusable and they use something known as Shadow DOM, which we briefly discussed in the third point when we're learning about DOM and Shadow DOM. So what Shadow DOM essentially is, is you can think of as a private part of a DOM tree, right? So what do I mean by that? If you have an HTML document which is constructed, you can have a Shadow DOM of this particular, in this particular area where the CSS, for example, you're writing for the HTML you're writing it for is scoped, right? Just like you have CSS modules in React, if you have seen that, which is scoped to a particular module, Shadow DOM also allows you to have a, a region like that. But of course, it's it's more powerful and has a bunch of more features than that. But yeah, I mean, learning about web components, how to create your own web components, publish them online, use them in different applications is also something you should know about as an HTML developer because sooner or later if any one framework adds support for generic web components it'll be you know it'll be you'll be seeing a lot more usage of that css is that one unavoidable thing which you have to learn as a developer if you want to build any decent front-end app it doesn't matter if you don't like css or not you have to code that because the days are gone when you can just ship a raw html page now in today's time everyone expects you to have a nice decent landing page at least for your basic website as well but what does it take to become a master an expert at css 
In this video, I want to discuss a few topics which are important, which you should consider visiting or revisiting if you haven't done them yet and see if you really, really understand those topics or not, because there are infinite things in CSS. CSS pretty much is a programming language on its own at this point because it's too complex and there are so many new things you can try out. But these few fundamentals you are going to need for pretty much anything you do in your CSS world. Let's take a look at that in this video. All right, so the very first thing I'm gonna start off with is the box model in CSS. Now, box model is so ridiculously important that I would not recommend pretty much anything else in CSS to learn before you actually learn box model. And a lot of people start not with box model and that's completely fine, but given a choice to relearn CSS, I would learn a lot more about box model before I dive into anything else, especially of the layouts part, that is the grid and the flex box. Now, what exactly is box model? Well, very simply speaking, box model means how the margin, the padding, the borders, these properties behave around an element in CSS, right? So learning about if you have a content, how does the padding, and then the margin, and the border like really behaves is really the essence of the box model. So understanding that is like super important. Once you understand the basics of box model, I would recommend seeing if you actually understand layouts in CSS as well. At least for now, I would recommend Flexbox and Grid Layout. But if you want to really solidify your CSS learnings and understandings, you can also take a look at what is known as floats in CSS. Now floats has a lot of use cases except, you know, just, just not for layouts. It is used in a lot of hacky ways sometimes as well. And this is why this is a little bit dicey. So you should probably consider this when you are more or like intermediate with CSS, then figure out what floats are, how clear works, how floats on pseudo elements works and so on. But for now, Flexbox and Grid are your best friends in order to create most of the complex layouts you see on various websites, right? Now, when I say learn layouts, what do I really mean is that if I give you a layout, something like this, I want you to draw this layout in HTML and CSS with Flexbox and Grid individually, right? And you should be able to do that. You should be able to visualize in your mind that, okay, if I want to do this with Flexbox, maybe this is one element, then this might be another element and so on. So you should be able to visualize how you would make that particular layout. Similarly for grid as well. And the more layouts you practice with, the better your understanding would get in terms of how Flexbox and grid and these various properties on the, these layouts work. So like this is like super important. The third thing I would recommend for you is to actually understand about units in CSS. This is also very important and a lot of times people overlook this when you get confused between pixels ems rems sometimes even pointers vh vw so these all sorts of older and newer units are there now so understand about them what does truly a pixel mean how does it differ on various screens like you know if you are using a website on a retina ipad what does the pixel really mean and this is like kind of an advanced stuff, uh, a little bit on the advanced side, but we are talking about how you master CSS. And a person who knows a lot about CSS would actually know a lot about these units as well. How REM works, how REM in conjunction with EM or pixel works. So there are all sorts of nuances around how these units work and operate in CSS. So learn about them. After this, I would also recommend learning about a bunch of new CSS3 things. For example, calc function is super handy, super useful. Variables in CSS is very, very useful for reusability and keeping your code base clean without actually using things like SAS. So that is also very important. New features like, you know, new units, for example, VH and VW are also something which you can cover in this one. So having a look at and knowing about what CSS3 features or CSS3 plus as well, which is like, you know, beyond CSS3, what all sorts of features are available and what you, can you use right now in browsers? Super important stuff. Now, while we are discussing about units in general, I also want to tell you that how important it would be for you to learn about how to make your websites responsive using CSS media queries. So understanding about media queries in general and about making your websites responsive in general is also 
like i would say the fundamental difference between a good developer and a master developer in css right those people know how to set breakpoints those people know when to change the layout from this complex layout to a simple stack based layout which is usually what you would find on mobile phones and how to do that that's also like super important when i say how i mean like usually purely with css because if you use javascript it involves all sorts of cumulative layout shifts and hacks and this and that but yeah i mean making sure that you know about how media queries operate how you can make them responsive and your website responsive with the correct units in place this is like already getting too much into a little bit of advanced side of things so i would highly recommend you to take up your few projects which you know which were not responsive or you know just download a few projects which are not responsive and try to convert them to responsive web sixth i would recommend about animations so animations obviously is not for everyone in the sense that obviously not every front end would require a lot of animations but if you're talking about mastering css then animations is a big part of that because animation has first class support in css you can create some beautiful animations especially with css3 and the new keyframes and this and that things which are not available before you can do a lot more damage so learning about all sorts of keyframes and how they work i would also throw in something like bezier curves i think that's how you pronounce it i'm not sure if i'm pronouncing it right but bezier curves is a it's it's like a mathematical formula of having how an animation proceeds from zero to end so some animations you would have seen is they start fast and they end slow right so this is like one example of a bezier curve some animations start very slow and then immediately ends right some animations which are linear they have a bezier curve of this so understanding about these curves which curve might look better in what sort of animation spring animations this and that so this is also a little bit on the ux side of things but again if you are working with css you pretty much are working with the user experience so you have to know a little bit about that as well seventh thing which comes to my mind is using something like post css or not exactly using at least knowing about post css and sass now what these tools do is that just talking a little bit about sass is that it gives your css superpowers in the sense that you can nest your selectors you can use variables you can use functions you can do all sorts of stuff but to be honest the only two features which i have really used when i'm using sass is variables in css which is also like natively available now and the second one is actually the nesting of selectors this is probably the best feature out there and i wouldn't be too surprised if css brings native support for nesting selectors in the next 4 5 years so that is awesome other than that post css is also very useful especially when you don't want to write a lot of css properties but want to you know let's say support all sorts of browser quirks so auto prefixer is a plugin for post css which allows you to you know just write something once and then generate the webkit or moz or this and that styles automatically then there are something some plugins like css nano for example and you know all sorts of bunch of plugins which you can hook into this post css ecosystem which allows you to manipulate your final css generation so what this tooling does is that it allows you to write fresh clean modern css but also then backport it to all the previous browsers which might need some hacks or something to support that code out of the box so knowing about this tooling is super important and then last but not the least but the eighth point i can think of is knowing your way around dev tools of css now dev tools is a game changer of course and you have to learn them as a front end developer but knowing how to navigate your way around dev tools is also super important skill especially because css just like html does not complain if that is not working right for example if you use post css and a couple of plugins you can actually add a layer of validation in css but if it is is in working if the css is in working then you have to directly inspect the dom right you have to see what is happening on the website really in the dom tree so knowing about dom and nodes and css specificity and how css works and you know how you can manipulate the css using dev tools how you can debug that essentially from your browser directly it's a game changer and it's a must 
requirement for anyone who wants to master CSS. Before we start this video, I want to say this is not going to be your average how to become a JavaScript developer. The title is how to really master JavaScript as a developer. Now, for all of you who have no idea what JavaScript is, this video is not for you. For all those beginner slash intermediate programmers who are looking to go towards the advanced side of the road, let's go. So this video assumes that you already have a basic understanding of JavaScript. You are able to create pages. You even have experience with React or any other framework. You have worked with Node.js a little or at least heard about it you have a basic experience in building an app with javascript now the next question becomes what all things or what all you need to do to become an advanced developer maybe you are working for one two three four years in a job where you have gained some experience but what's next in javascript how do you level up to a senior developer or you know, become a great developer with JavaScript. In this video, I'll be discussing some points which are gonna be very important in order to do that. Now, the first point which I want to mention is we'll start with the language and then go deep down into the actual JavaScript under the hood stuff. I'm gonna start with the first thing that is more concepts. What you are really doing oftentimes, and you might have also realized this, is you use a very small subset of knowledge to do a very large number of tasks, right? If you're building a React app, it might seem like React have a lot of things to learn, but when you're actually building some component, when you're actually creating a state or, you know, some sort of interactivity, your 95% of the work is probably done with just 20% of the knowledge required in React. Right. In that case, a lot of times if you have taken up a JavaScript course or anything, you probably either miss out on some important concepts or don't even learn them. Right. So some of those concepts are, for example, closures in JavaScript. You might be using this all the time, but this is an important part of the language. Right. Another one which comes to my mind is prototypes in JavaScript. Again, this is not used that much. Therefore, it might be difficult to you know, just understand this, but these are underlying features and underlying ways of the language working and you should know them because if you are becoming an advanced developer, chances are you would be thrown at any random piece of code and you have to at least make some idea out of it or you have to be comfortable on the first look. You cannot just Google that what this program is even doing, right? I mean, you should Google stuff, but you should not be a developer who has absolutely no idea what a program does when you're looking at it until it's like, you know, some really cryptic code. And even in this more concepts, we can also place in something like new features, which are new things JavaScript as a language which is adding. Now, I'm not a lot in favor of this because JavaScript, because now releases a new version of ECMAScript every single year. So sometimes I feel like they are just pushing in new and new features all the time. But yeah, I mean, for, for some of the features are really interesting. So maybe for point three, just following a regular YouTube channel like CodeDam or any other channel out there would be just more than enough. All right, let's go down a little bit. This is, you know, on the surface, you probably might have done this already. You might not have. The second thing you should know as a beginner or intermediate to advanced developer is how the asynchronous model in JavaScript works. And when I say asynchronous model, I mean the following concepts. Obviously, the first one you might have guessed when we say about asynchronous in JavaScript behavior, and that is event loop. Now, how does JavaScript really work? Like, what's the true behavior of JavaScript? It is not a simple, you know, language which is understood on the runtime and then executed line by line. It's not as simple as that. It uses something which is a little bit complex known as event loop. I have done multiple videos on JavaScript which goes into one way or another in event loop. I'll link some video here which is an advanced Node.js course, some part of which covers event loop in great detail, but maybe we'll do a you know, a standalone video for event loop as well. So event loop is important. Again, this brings us to topics like micro task queues. And this is basically part of event loop and stuff. Promises and callbacks, how these things like really work. Because I mean, it's all fine and good as long as you have an await of X, Y, Z, and then, you know, some sequential code. But let's say you are debugging a piece of software which has a bug. If you know, if you have these knowledge, inside your head then you might be able to think of that scenario that what might happen right now for me what happens is a lot of times when i'm working with a code base just getting that error again just triggers some memory that oh i have seen this bug before because of how promises and how micro tasks and different sort of queues behave right it might be rare but again 
if you want to be on the advanced side you would have to have experience with the rare situations as well because for pretty much all beginner and intermediate doubts and questions you will find them on stack overflow on github this can also include stuff like you know going deep into v8 like how os level stuff works again this is discussed in that advanced node.js course for example your javascript is not truly single threaded why because your operating system is multi-threaded right so even if your node.js process is sitting right here it can use your operating system which is windows or mac or anything and this can spin up multiple threads for let's say network requests right you're sending four network requests in javascript so this is not a single threaded behavior right your node.js is single threaded but your operating system sends the network request so it might be indirectly multi-threaded but yeah i mean just understanding about things like these can unlock a lot of brain juice for you to use to debug different issues talking so much about debugging actually brings me to the third and probably the most important aspect of a senior developer or somebody who has worked a lot with javascript and that is debugging and profiling your code and this is a territory where i am also learning a lot of new things every single day i'll tell you what so what debugging really means is that you you are able to efficiently debug a program right and this will obviously have some qualitative and quantitative qualities the first one is experience the more experience you have the more errors you have seen the more weird edge cases you have seen the more quickly you will be able to trigger that memory cell in your brain the next time you see that right but alongside experience what you can do is you should also start using the debugger which is the node.js debugger or you know you're using chrome debugger or you know vs code also ships with a chrome debugger because vs code is essentially running on electron which is chrome but start using debuggers official debuggers of the language i mean it sounds cool to use console log and it's all meme and fun and all jokes but real debugging can only happen in serious code bases when you're using these debuggers most of the time i mean console logs are definitely helpful but if you want to just check and sit back and even reverse engineer i mean i do a bunch of reverse engineering videos that cannot be done absolutely without debuggers so that stuff requires you to have a bit of debugging knowledge with javascript and profiling profiling is interesting because this is like i said something i'm also learning i don't have a lot of experience with how you really profile your code in a great way but profiling essentially means let's say your code has a memory leak how do you debug that so this involves something like v8 snapshots for you know you just take the heap snapshot which is the area where all the variables and stuff is allocated and then you try to figure out which part of the memory is growing continuously and you know if you are working on a more senior level netflix level stuff where they are using node.js in production you can also use flame graphs to actually profile how bad node.js cpu execution is so what does this mean this means flame graphs is one of the tools which is used to see how slow or fast or you know how much cpu time is being consumed so let's say you have a job at netflix where you have to speed up a certain execution because it's critical and it you know runs a billion times a day or something and that uses node.js so your first job would be to actually figure out what is the biggest bottleneck in that program execution right and bottlenecks are usually cpu bound with node.js because of you know node.js being a relatively slower language or a runtime a lot of people get triggered when i say node.js is a language but the idea here is that profiling your code with the heap snapshots and debugging your cpu usage with things like flame graphs this is sort of advanced right this is i won't say like you would need this as a even as an advanced developer in a lot of cases but when you're doing a lot of profiling this becomes really really interesting right so if you have any more profiling information please feel free to share in the comments below i am also learning this area but two things which i have found are memory leaks and you know cpu execution and these are the tools which you have to learn in order to be a good developer now this is all fine i mean we just kept going down in the you know in the complexity but i believe you should also be aware about the general ecosystem and the toolkits like i said whether those, those are debuggers whether those are you know just logic and how you debug some practices whether those are tools like webpack or babel because if you're not familiar with ecosystem and especially these tools like on front end they play a major role they might just catch you off guard right so just know about the existence of these tools what their purpose is babel is for transpiling webpack is for bundling that's pretty much it and if you know everything else you can 
basically figure out the ecosystem i mean relatively quickly but mastering this part with the help of a lot of experience is the hard job and again this is information sure this is something you need to learn but this is also a combination of a lot of time which is like you know another word of saying experience so there are two barriers to becoming an advanced developer the first one is obviously the information where you consume it and the time which is pretty much you cannot overcome that i mean everyone has a different range of time where over which they will learn something right but this is in general i believe a good way of going the advanced level and a lot of topics on this board you can find on the code dams full stack developer path which again i pretty much leave the comment uh, as a pinned comment in every single video so make sure you check out the full stack developer path if you're somebody who's just starting off or if you're somebody who's just intermediate we will have these courses if not now definitely this year up and running on more advanced side of things as well and of course meanwhile you can just go ahead and check the node.js advanced course as well which is hosted on youtube which is also on code dam if you have full stack developer path access but yeah that's pretty much it for what i wanted to share in this video so that is all for this one i hope you understood some new things you got to know some new things if you did let me know in the comments which thing was something which was extremely new to you something which you relatively knew let me know in the comments below what your feedback was that is all for this video make sure you leave a like subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon that just helps the algorithm and i'm gonna see you in the next video really soon